<laughs> All right, let's uh, dive right in. Um, two weeks ago, in our first session, uh, I tried to provide a very broad overview to the figures that we'll be discussing. Um, this week, we're going to do a more historical deep dive, just to set up the context, to try to understand what these men and women were doing, what they thought they were doing, um, and the effect that it would have on this new world that was emerging that no one knew about, this new new Christendom, as it would come to be called over the next thousand years. Uh, that will set us up to have then hopefully three subsequent conversations where we look more at the theology and practice of the Desert Fathers, which is my intent for the series, um, not just to take a time machine and go back and you know, sort of ogle over these strange people, uh, but to learn from them, hopefully, uh, to to tweak and adjust what we might need to tweak and adjust in their context to, to fit our own without distorting who they were, without turning them into caricatures, which is always the difficult task of doing any kind of historical theology, not to make our over-familiarity with the problems of the present um, distort the voices we hear from the past, um, to make them more or less challenging, uh, but also to bring them into some kind of communion with us, to assume that they're not completely other, uh, because if they were completely other, we wouldn't be having this conversation. They would not have lasted. Uh, but they have lasted. I'm going to return to this passage, sort of our orienting gospel passage, uh, from the Gospel of Mark, um, which sets up Lent for us, you know, our image of being in the desert, um, and also serves as kind of an image or an exemplar for what the men and women of the desert were, uh, were doing. Justin, would you mind reading this for sure. us? Sure. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. And as he was coming up out of the water, he immediately saw the heavens being ripped apart and the spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in you I have taken delight. And immediately the Spirit cast him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tested by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were serving him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in our, our first session, I asked the question, what, what was Jesus doing up there? You know, we, we kind of played with that a little bit. Here, I want to propose one possible answer to that uh, that would be taken up by, by our subjects. Jesus was going to make a new Eden. He was going into the desert where nothing grew, where there were just wild beasts um, and apparently devils. Uh, and he was going there, in a sense, to conquer, though without the sort of martial or militaristic image we would, we would think of as conquering. He was going to, to cultivate, to turn the desert back into paradise. And so we see in Mark's gospel that he manages to be out there with the wild animals, and angels come to serve him. Uh, the word serve there uh, is the same root word from which we get the word deacon. Um, it has overtones of feeding him. That is, he was, he's being fed by this food from heaven, maybe mina, if we want to... Uh, pick up on some other desert motifs in the Old Testament. Um, but also, angels are, are doing his behest, turning the desert into a place of paradise. Uh, does anyone know why he leaves in Mark? Anyone know what calls him out of the desert? It is not that he's found it unbearable uh, and needs to get back to civilization. Something triggers his departure. A death. John the Baptist is executed. Jesus somehow hears about it uh, and goes back to Galilee to begin his ministry. Um, but one could tell a different story where he's just fine, where he is. Maybe people find him out there. Um, okay, that's enough to kind of get us, get us thinking. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about the themes of God, neighbor, and self, um, sort of what it means that the Desert Fathers and Mothers left society and what they found when they did, or to put it in the form of a question, how do you love your neighbor when you're trying to run away from him or 
Um, and I think there are, there are a lot of insights for us. Um, and it'll allow us to reflect on and review uh, the pandemic, our experience of quarantine, times when we had to flee one another, and maybe what we found there. In session four, uh, and probably most of five too, we're going to look at a, a dramatic theme, um, sort of the spiritual practice that emerges out of this tradition of, of following the, the train of one's thoughts to discover what, what is happening there, where the demons are, where the angels are, um, and learning to put up with oneself. Uh, and, and from this we get the, the famous eight deadly thoughts, uh, which would become the seven deadly sins of the Western church. And then session five will largely be a wrap up. We can look at some other themes. All right, we return to this area. Uh, we're looking primarily at Egypt. Um, similar kinds of monasticism emerge in places like Syria and Palestine, uh, but it's a little bit more charismatic. We're looking at these worker monks. Um, and here I want to establish the word monk is inclusive. It just means a solitary. Uh, later on, the church is going to develop monks and nuns, um, but here a monk can be a man or a woman, just someone who lives alone in the desert. So when I say monks, uh, and we'll, we're going to be introduced to some of the, the famous women monks, um, just imagine someone mostly dirty wearing bar very little uh, of either gender, uh, and in most cases you can't really tell um, because these people have been living there for a long time. But I want to ask what's going on in the world such that these men and women, beginning in uh, the fourth century and into you know, the next several centuries, decide to flee to the desert, some to live alone, uh, but many to establish cities, you know, colonies of, of monks who live and work together alone. Um, and so we have to begin uh, with this guy, Diocletian. Um, in 284, he is successful in the Balkans, uh, as most military leaders were, um, and he is acclaimed emperor by, uh, by his troops. Now, leading up to this is a period where there had been over a dozen emperors in 30 years. I mean, it's just up and down in the Roman Empire. Um, but this man, Diocles, who becomes Diocletian, uh, eliminates his rivals, and he works hard to reform the empire. There's already a sense among the, the elites that the empire is in trouble. Tax bases are in trouble. They're beginning to deal with the people they'll call the barbarians, you know, the Germanic peoples. Um, and so he sets about uh, these reforms that are meant to help shore up both the tax base and the sense of who the Romans <coughs> are. Um, he opposes price controls. He raises taxes, always popular. Um, and he begins to really fortify the frontiers uh, against lands that Rome had not yet conquered. He also begins to incorporate elements from the East. Uh, in this world, the East is, is where civilization is. Um, he incorporates elements from, uh, from Babylon, from Persia, into his own sort of Western style of governance to tell people how fancy the Romans, the Romans really are. Um, we are civilized. We may have gotten away from that, but we are truly civilized. Most importantly for us, he completely overhauls the structure of the empire. He divides it into four parts, east and west, and then both east and west have a senior and a junior emperor. You don't need to remember any of this. Um, so you've got a senior emperor of the west and a junior emperor. When the senior emperor dies, the junior emperor simply steps into his stead and they find a new uh, a new junior emperor, and this is meant to solve the thorny problem of who gets to be Caesar next, which had plagued Rome for, for 30 years. Um, four parts, seniority clearly marked. Um, sounds great in theory, but in practice, it led to constant rivalry. Junior emperors plotting against their senior emperors, um, and especially this division between East and West uh, creates a rift that's never really healed. In fact, we still kind of feel it today. Um, over the next several decades, there would be a bewildering number of junior and Caesar emperors sort of rising and falling. Uh, I don't know their names. I don't know that we need to. But the other part of the legacy that will affect what's going on in Egypt is his insistence that we need to get back to Roman ways of life, to good Roman religion. Um, 
and a traditional religious practice that recognizes the existence of various and manifold gods um, who are all sort of like their, their human counterparts vying for power, but who kind of exist in harmony. Uh, what there wasn't room, uh, room for were any religious sects or movements that showed hostility to the sort of harmonious existence of all the gods from East and West, uh, namely Christians, right? Um, Christians in particular came under suspicion. Soldiers were becoming Christian and renouncing their oaths, uh, leaving the army because they wouldn't, didn't want to serve under the banners of gods, including Caesar, who was sort of divinized. Uh, Christian members of the court tried to avoid participating in civic ceremonies because of the religious overtones of those events. Um, and this all had a ripple effect uh, that just kind of cast some shade on how functioning the court was when one of your highest ranking members refuses to sacrifice a grain of incense to the emperor. It causes pause. And so um, Diocletian creates some legal penalties uh, that are gradually escalated um, from discharge from office, if you're, if you're an elite, um, social stigma, eventually the outright burning of churches uh, and confiscation of, of properties. Now by church, I mean the room you have attached to your house where your, your Christian friends meet. Um, we don't have yet like basilicas or anything like that. Um, clergy are arrested during this period. Uh, books of scripture are burnt um, and church property is confiscated and added to the coffers of Rome, which is nice. Uh, the persecution differed in various parts. It was worst in the east, I don't think, yeah, it doesn't look. Worst in the east and tamest in the west. And in fact, um, up here, the district of Constantius, uh, who is Caesar of, um, of the West, uh, there are no martyrs, few churches burnt, and not so many properties, properties confiscated. Um, there's no sign that Constantius is a Christian, but he just doesn't seem interested in, in riling up his own people uh, to deal with the space. But in East and North Africa, um, where we are located uh, in, in the image of our desert fathers and mothers, the edicts are strictly enforced. And so the Egyptian church uh, saw a period of years that were very hard indeed. They saw martyrs, uh, people killed, so bad that the Coptic church actually dates its calendar from the beginning of the persecution. Um, the age of the martyrs begins in uh, 284. And so this would become linked with the Egyptian fathers and mothers in their imagination, sort of where Egyptian Christianity started, a period of persecution. And even when the persecution wanes and eventually dies out, they still have it in mind that they want to imitate those who went to the sword rather than sort of give up their faith. Um, the, the people who go to the desert are seen as the spiritual successors of, of these martyrs, um, becomes known later, and later scholarship is white martyrdom. Uh, not red as in blood, but a sort of peaceful martyrdom, but martyrdom nonetheless. Um, it also produced serious division in the local churches, uh, where you'd have one bishop um, sort of cave and give in to the Romans, uh, and another would not, and then that later, or the first bishop comes back and tries to ordain people, and the bishop, or the one you know, following the bishop who was martyred, says, no, you gave in, you're no longer a bishop here, um, you can't do this, and so you have this church split that continues to mark the stories that we have where um, desert fathers and mothers are sometimes asked who they side with. Um, we won't get into the details of that, but this is a time of church conflict. In fact, all of Christianity is a time of church conflict. There's never a time when it's not the case. Um, across the em emperor, empire, the number of martyrs were, in fact, relatively few. When we think of the time of persecution, um, you know, thousands and certainly not tens of thousands of people are not being killed by the Romans. Uh, the imperium, the idea of Roman power, preferred to be subtle. If you have to kill people, you're not doing things right, right? There are other ways of applying pressure, especially social pressure. So they didn't, you know, the, the style of Roman rule didn't particularly like having to do these kinds of things. Uh, just sometimes it was necessary to have an example. We see this even in our own Gospels, where you don't get the sense that Pilate wants to have to execute anyone. He will do it, and he won't lose sleep over it. That's his wife's job. 
but he he <laughs> would rather you know power be demonstrated through people acquiescing. That is true power. Um, but the persecution wasn't sustainable. It wasn't popular. Uh, it wasn't popular at the local level. These were people's neighbors, friends, uncles, and even when they disagreed on religious grounds and you know your friends are doing weird stuff, you don't necessarily like it when the police come to town and are rounding this up. So um, even before the edicts are rescinded, the persecution begins to wane, especially again in the West, where it wasn't very popular. In 305, Diocletian gets sick, and he abdicates to his own junior emperor. Um, and so that junior emperor, who had been the junior emperor of the East, that spot is vacant. Everyone expects the senior emperor's son, Constantine, to inherit that position. Uh, father and son will rule. It'll be as Luke and Darth Vader always imagined. But that doesn't happen. Um, instead, it's given to someone else, and Constantine just has to kind of be uh, his, his father's son. And so he sets out to join his father, who's now the emperor of the West, in some military campaigns um, to continue to sort of extend Roman rule into, into the West. Um, eventually, Constantius dies, and Constantine's troops acclaim him as senior emperor of the West. Right? And this is, you know, if your troops call you an emperor and you have enough of them, then dang it, you're an emperor. Uh, and he expects uh, some pushback, but instead, the eastern senior emperor, Galerius, says, you can be junior emperor. We're not going to make you senior emperor, but you, you can have the title. And Constantine agrees. He says, that's, that's good enough for me. Um, and the first thing he does, as junior emperor up here uh, in Gaul, mainly, and in Britannia, is he completely rescinds the edicts against Christianity. Christianity it becomes tolerable. He's not a Christian, um, but he ends the persecution in his area. Soon, Galerius, the emperor of, of the East, would follow suit, um, and he would ask Christians to pray to their god for the good of the emperor. He's trying to invite the Christian god to join, um, to join the others on Olympus, so to speak. Um, trying to get the Christians to say, we can all play together. Your god, you know, pray to your god, we'll pray to our god, we can all get along. Um, and so he begins to recognize the, legit the legitimacy of Christians to worship alongside other Romans, uh, however strange the Christian way is. Galerius dies the next year, and things get really complicated. I'm going to spare you the details, but essentially, or essentially Constantine spends the next 10 years conquering all of this. He takes troops, he moves through, uh, he enters Rome, proclaims himself Caesar of the West, he builds this arch, which is still there. Um, and on this way, he has a vision of a god, uh, of the god Sol, uh, Sol Invictus, um, the undefeatable sun, uh, which was a, a very popular cult of the time. Um, and he proclaims himself to be sort of the servant of this Sol Invictus, this sun god. Um, this uh, mosaic of Sol Invictus uh, still exists in the Vatican Necropolis. Some scholars think that Christians used it as a sort of sign for Jesus, and so this is either the sun god um, carrying the sun across, uh, across the sky, or it's Jesus, the sun. Um, we're not sure. Um, but he, he conquers in the name of this sun, um, and his army believes that he and they are under divine protection of sort of the most high God, who's also the sun. Um, once he conquers Rome, he builds his arch, he becomes a catechumen in the church. Um, and at this time, becoming a catechumen means you are a Christian. You're entitled to Christian burial. Um, to be on the way is to be part of it. He just puts off baptism until right before he dies. But he allies himself with the Christian church, and he builds, uh, he builds a church. He builds a church for the Roman bishop at the site of what is now the Church of St. John the Lateran. Um, it goes away in time, I think it burns or is sacked. But the Lateran church is, is um, created in its stead. So it's not clear 
what's going on in Constantine's mind. Okay, it's APT. Um, you know, scholars have spilled ink back and forth about how how sincere Constantine was in his conversion, uh, about what was going on with his vision of the sun, which gets later rewritten as a vision of Jesus, actually. Um, but we have competing accounts of that. That's all an interesting story. Um, I I don't know. Uh, what's clear is he does become a catechumen, and wherever he goes, it gets easier to be a Christian. Um, and this is a great relief to people who have seen their relatives die. Um, so wherever he goes, there's some kind of peace for Christians, but there ain't peace for people who he's conquering because he is a soldier, uh, and a very good one, in fact. And so he meets, um, eventually he meets all of the, the other emperors on the battlefield, and he conquers, he wins. By 324, he is the sole emperor of the Roman Empire. He moves the capital from Rome to, anyone know? Constantinople. Constantinople. Right, so the Roman emperor is now based in the east. It's now based in Constantinople, center of Greek life, of, of Byzantine art. Um, and this is sort of following Diocletian's impulse. This is a way to shore up the clout of mighty Rome, because this is where all the culture is. Rome is a backwater. Rome is Hicktown. We're going to New York City. That's where we want to be. So Constantinople becomes the center of the empire. It's also kind of an important point, uh, geographically speaking. And he settles a policy regarding religion. Uh, this becomes known as the Edict of Milan. It's not really an edict. It's more a letter circulated. It's an encyclical, which is where we get that word, to all the governors of the various provinces saying religious freedom is now the official uh, policy of the Roman Empire. Everyone should be able to worship whichever god they deem fit as individuals. That is what Constantine does. He does not make Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. That wouldn't happen until Theodosius, uh, almost 100 years later, um, 50 years later. Constantine sort of founds the idea of religious freedom, that anyone, anywhere, should be able to worship the gods that they want. Um, it also recognizes the Christian church as a legal corporation that's entitled to properties. They can draw taxes or tithes um, and have other privileges. And he does with the church what he did with the emperor. He wants to consolidate it. At this time, before Constantine, the Christian churches are all over the place. There are various kinds of Christianities. They don't agree on a whole lot of things, who Jesus is, when Easter is, how they should celebrate the Eucharist, whether we should use milk or wine. That's a conflict apparently, um, things are, are a little bit disheveled, and Constantine doesn't like this, um, especially issues regarding who Jesus is and when Easter should be, the conflicts that he sees. Now, it's not clear that he cares as a theologian. He just doesn't like um, a mess. And so he calls all of the bishops, not all of the bishops, some of the bishops, to Nicaea, um, and he says, work it out. I'm calling this council. Work it out. Uh, and he doesn't let them leave until they do. Uh, and work it out they do in the form of the Nicene Creed uh, and settling the date of Easter. Um, this will go on getting refined at a later council. But it creates a statement of faith that's meant to be universal wherever there are Christians, so that if you can't pray that statement of faith, you're not a Christian. Easy peasy, right? Um, and lots of churches go on not being able to pray that creed. I think they go on being Christians, but uh, they're recognized as heretics. Uh, the churches of the East. So uniformity. One faith, one church, one emperor, one empire. He dies in 337. He is baptized by his priest and biographer, uh, Eusebius of Nicomedia, who's very interested in telling the story of Constantine as someone that God picked to do all this stuff. Um, interestingly, uh, someone like Athanasius is probably going to be writing against Eusebius. He doesn't want to see Caesar as being God's instrument in the way that um, Eusebius does. At this time, <clears throat> Christianity is more or less 10% of the population. So a sizable minority, but a minority indeed. The Roman Empire, when we imagine it, especially in Egypt, we picture temples to all the gods, right? And people worshiping the way that they have been with blood and sacrifice and money and sex and all the great things that make up our religious landscape. That's what they're doing. 
questions about Constantine before we move on? We're almost done with the history. Yeah? I thought Constantine's mother had an influence in terms of building churches, or is that yet to come? Yeah, uh, St. Helen does, um, and there are lots of stories about her finding the true cross in Jerusalem and sort of going on her own pilgrimage uh, to establish churches. Um, so there are those stories. I don't know them that well. Um, it's not clear how much of them are historical, <coughs> how much is sort of later, later imagination. That does build, in fact, on what she might have done. Um, we just don't know about Constantine's relationship with his mom, about how much that would have played a role. Probably some. Um, and we already have evidence that Constantine's father was very lenient towards Christians, so maybe that is because uh, Helen was, in fact, a Christian. But, yeah. A um, couple questions. Yeah. Can you remind us geographically where Nicaea is? Um, it's somewhere in here. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of, like, uh, Episcopal representation at the council... I presume it was mostly the Eastern bishops yes. close by there. Yes. Um, I, I'm pretty sure the Roman bishop was not. He, send, he sends two priests okay. to sort of represent him. But yeah, mm -hmm. the, the Roman bishop, okay, the pope, doesn't really participate in councils, uh, interestingly. Um, could you give us a, br like a brief overview of what Constantine's relationship was like to the church in Rome? I mean, obviously you said he contributed to building a church uh, there, but um, I, I think we, you know, we like were led to believe that like the idea that Rome had this like unquestioned sort of primacy always for yeah. every part of the empire, it, like it's sort of calling that into question a bit. Could you give us like a brief overview? Of um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know all that much other than Constantine clearly didn't intend to stay in Rome and he didn't intend to recognize Rome as being any particular seat of primacy. Now there were already theological arguments that the Bishop of Rome as the successor of Peter um, has a certain role to play in church governance um, but probably one of many equal patriarchs um, by moving to Constantinople he really is recognizing the Christian East as being where Christianity is sort of seated. Um, all of the major councils would take place around there um, and you know, while this whole area would eventually go on to be um, conquered is a strong word, but um, Roman rule would decline seriously over the next several hundred years in the West. It would take a while before that happened in the East. So the East continues to be sort of a thriving place. Um, it's not until Charlemagne that the idea that Rome actually exists in Rome uh, comes back to the West, and that is clearly a historical reinvention um, as for Constantine's particular relationship to the popes of Rome, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I'm sure there are answers, but uh, that's not something I prepared for. The relationship between Christians and the synagogue at this point in history? Depends on the place. Um, largely, you, know, you still have, so Christianity is largely an urban affair. It takes place in cities. Um, and by this point, um, Jews and Christians have begun to recognize one another as being different, which is not the case even in the period of the New Testament. Um, synagogues also, I, under, I think, suffered under the Diocletian rule, but Rome had been dealing with the Jews for long enough that they knew how to, how to play ball. Um, and they, they were at least a venerable religion. What Rome didn't like were new, new things. Uh, especially new things that didn't fit in. Um, there were some areas where Christians and Jews continued to get along. In fact, some areas where Jewish Christians continued to just be Jewish Christians, um, especially, uh, I think, in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, but I don't know whether I can answer, generally speaking, what the relationship between Christians and Jews were like during this period. Um, yeah, anyone have any expertise to draw on? Some answer to that? That's a good question. We do see already Christian theologians using Jews as like a foil, as an other. Um, so they're not friends. Um, they're, they're already beginning the harmful theological tropes that would continue to plague us for forever. <laughs>
Okay. So, what does this mean for Egypt? Why, why do we do all this? A couple reasons. First of all, hopefully because it's just kind of interesting. Um, but when we think about this time, in order to understand what the Desert Fathers and Mothers think they're doing, we need to think of it as a time of warring gods. Right? So, this is not modernity. This is a time where humans perceive themselves to be on the lower layer of uh, a sort of model of reality that has successive, higher, more powerful layers, angels, demons, gods, spirits, ghosts, you name it, um, and everyone with a different take on it, depending on where you were. And they all just sort of work together as a hodgepodge. Um, so if you go to Rome, you can find a temple to pretty much anyone. Uh, in fact, establishing a new temple to a god is an interesting sort of exercise in how you can fit into, how you borrow from older things and innovate and make it new enough that people are interested, um, but not so new as to irritate people like the Christians did. It's a lot like marketing, actually, now that I think of it, like trying to find your niche. Um, in a sense, Constantine's conversion is entirely Roman. He discovers a god who can help him win battles. How do you know your god is powerful? He helps you win. He gives you money, you're prosperous, your, your crops increase, uh, you have sons and not daughters, and if you're a general, then, and truly, unfortunately, uh, if you're a general, then your armies conquer. And so his armies believed that he was favored by Sol Invictus, this Roman god. Um, and so he comes to regard the high god of the Christians, Jesus' dad, as being the most high god worthy of worship. What's the proof for Constantine? He wins, right? That, and that's a very Roman way of looking at things, a very ancient Near Eastern way of looking at things. Um, and so worshiping the Christian God brings prosperity. We should worship the Christian God. Constantine is now emperor. Maybe we should worship his God too. Um, you know, and, but you do have to become a Christian to do so, and that brings about all kinds of interesting practices. Um, so here I want to quote uh, the historian Peter Brown, who's still sort of the... Uh, the, the scholar par exemplar for this period. Each god had his or, her own, his or her own religio, it was a religious practice, just as each city and each locality had its own traditions. Hence, religions, very much in the plural, clearly differentiated ways of worship, each one appropriate to a specific god and a specific place. These were the hallmark of polytheism in the Roman world. To be a polytheist was to glory in the fact that the gods did not want unity. Rather, they expressed themselves through the infinite diversity of human customs inherited from the distant past. Customs that, in a large part, include daily and weekly rites to be performed at home, at temple, at shrine, as customarily as we pay our credit card bills. You go to the temple, you make sure the gods have gotten what they need, and that's what keeps the Nile raising. Um, so it's hard for us to reimagine being a Christian in these times, but it very much was not, it was a place where nobody denied the existence of these gods, not even the Christians. They just thought they were demons. You know, they thought that, um, whereas happy polytheists would be like, I don't, I don't really want to deal with Hermes, but I will if I'm in a town with a temple to him because I don't want to incur his disfavor. Um, they would see the gods as being varying moral uh, characters you know, um, and even Zeus was someone who went through shifts, times when Zeus was pretty much just a rapist and a bully, uh, to times when he was, um, especially for later philosophers, a lot like the one god. Um, Christians were encouraged and inherited a tradition that saw all of these powers as being fallen spirits, uh, so, somehow in rebellion against God. So when we apply all of this to to our Egyptian friends, we see a group that had recently emerged from widespread persecution. So they'd seen costs for being a Christian. Um, and they saw social and political events as having spiritual roots. That is, the things you see on the news, that stuff's happening not just because of what humans are doing, but it's evocative of what's going on in the spiritual realm. Uh, we still sometimes talk like this, or we find Christians who do. Um, and we can participate in that, but only like ants participate in that, my household, like mostly by <laughs> staying away. Some humans, and collective humans, 
might, uh, might become vessels for the work of a particular power, like Constantine. Uh, but we don't really go seeking that out. Uh, if you do, you know, the pra practice of magic was well spread uh, and mostly illegal throughout the Roman Empire because um, it was seen as sort of dabbling in things that you could really mess up, just like we should regulate weapons. You regulate magic uh, because it might actually work and you want to make sure that you know, your magicians are actually just your high priests. So the events that, are, that the Egyptians are seeing taking place all over the empire are the theater of the gods. And the story that they inherit, those who become Christian, uh, is that the creator god enters into the divine drama through Christ to overthrow the cosmic powers. Right? God has become incarnate in order to set things right. Right? Things are messed up on the earth. Not so much that humans are, are always squabbling and that happens, but that's because the gods themselves, the spiritual powers that run the weather, that make famines happen or not, uh, they too are at war with one another and with humanity. And so Jesus comes to establish dominion so that every power and principality um, is sort of brought back into line with the original harmony of the cosmos. And it is a cosmic vision. So the Christian difference wasn't just that they were taking the stage we have a new God, we're going to play the game with you, with others, but to identify all the other nations of the gods as being in direct rebellion against the God of Jesus Christ. Um, and that means that those who follow that God of Jesus Christ are going to do battle, are going to go to war with the cosmic powers in the way that Jesus did, which is not with a sword. Um, and the desert what these fathers and mothers are doing must be understood as being a place of battle. They are going to do battle against, uh, to conquer in many cases, or at least to uh, cohabitate with demons. But these demons are not other than the one lurking in the temple in my village back home, but also uh, the one major god, Rome. Rome is seen as being the divine city. Um, and so Rome's might is the ability to sort of marshal all of the gods, um, to see even the emperor as a godlike figure. Um, and so when we, when we hear about these Christians telling these stories about these powers, that's politics too. It's religion and politics. So what Roman armies are doing is seen as being what the gods are doing. And to take, to take aim at the gods at this time is also to take aim at, against the rulers who are enlisting these gods uh, as, as their helpers, which is why Christianity wasn't popular. You, know, you go to Ephesus, you become a Christian, uh, you start making it difficult for the idol makers to make their idols because they're making statues of demons. All of a sudden, a village that, or a city that had thrived based on making religious artifacts, uh, if that's put into jeopardy, your economy goes under and you blame the Christians and you run them out, which is what happens to Paul in Acts. So these villages uh, where the Desert Fathers and Mothers come from, they're newly Christianized. And Egyptian Christians tend to be, as you probably guessed, kind of a radical bunch. Um, but they still have temples to the Egyptian gods as well. And so we have to see, when people flee the desert, they're also fleeing polytheism, a sort of a religious landscape that they don't want to interact with. Um, and te these temples, there'd be Sacrifices offered, that is animals. Um, priests and priestesses provided visions of the future, promised good fortune, could help you have a baby, mm -hmm. could kill somebody if you paid enough, um, offered exorcisms, healings, um, and communion with the God. In fact, one of the things that sets the Desert Fathers and Mothers apart is you could have communion with the gods through participating in any number of rites at your local temple or in the field. Christians didn't think that they had that kind of access, um, that sort of immediate experience of the divine that could lead to rapture and joy. Um, it was very much a distanced relationship where any experience of the divine was put to the test and seen as being a possible source of temptation, sort of the deferred communion, if you will. So. In the, the emergence of, of renunciation in the desert, 
is it's indicative of a climate that can produce such fruit. Right? This didn't come from nowhere. People fled the villages because there were Christians there. And so the fruit of Egyptian Christianity was to produce monks. So what had to be true about the Christianity that was there? Um, that's the question we put to the Desert Fathers and Mothers. Because as I mentioned in our first session, they're never that far away. Even when they're far away, they sell baskets. They're kind of going home sometimes. They leave. They father their children. They run back to the monastery. Um, <laughs> the stories are there. Um, so something about their experiences tell us about the tensions of what it meant to be a Christian at that time. Because um, at a time when the empire was providing a source of order, was ordering the cosmos, uh, Christian churches were also claiming a certain kind of order that wasn't directly opposed to Roman rule, but it was also kind of doing its own thing. And at a time when only social equals gathered together to, to dine, to party, um, to, to talk, Christian churches spanned class, status, race, gender. Um, in that respect, the church often looked like the empire in miniature. And that was very much the vision of what some people thought they were doing a new empire, um, one that could do Roman religion without maybe all, all the blood. Okay, I'm going to say more about sort of how asceticism fits into this model uh, next week, but I want to close with some profiles. So I don't want these people to be um, completely, completely unknown. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about these five desert fathers, and then we'll talk about the desert mothers. Uh, but let me pause uh, for questions, insights. I'm really just trying to paint a picture of where these people are so that they can come alive as we read them, and so that we can understand their radical asceticism, their fasting, their obsession with sex, or more properly, fornication, which we'll talk about next week, um, how this is going to make sense. So hold on to all of this as we continue to talk. Yeah. So, John, the, the part that was coming to me is uh, in this whole presentation, and check check me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Is that what what you're trying to present to us is that this whole desert spirituality isn't just a nice form of praying. This is really a a a a reaction to and a sense of what really the church is about. Yes. As yes. opposed to all this great Christianity that's yes. going on. Okay. They, in a, in a real way, that's really helpful, Bob. These men and women think they're going to the desert to become Jesus. I mean, to the, the Jesus in, and we go back to the Mark reading, in baptism, in his baptism, the heavens are broken up, the spirit rushes into him, he goes into the desert and finds the desert to be a paradise. Right? He's able to do that. They see their baptisms, in some sense, and, you know, as empowering them to go do the same thing. So what does it take? What, is it, what do you have to do to yourself? Or what does God need to do to you? For you to go live alone in the desert and not only survive, but take Anthony. He lives to be 106, and that's probably accurate. And people who see him at the end of his life are startled by how like, sociable he is. He's a kind man. He's just, he can tell jokes. He's fun to be around. He doesn't necessarily want to be doing that, but he's not weird, right? He's become human. He also doesn't need to eat very much. Um, he, he, so something about the transformation, not only of the spirit, but of the body, has gripped the imagination of these men and women. Now, the people who compile these stories are not necessarily themselves saints. right? They're, they're picking up all the stories. So we see failures as well as successes. There are excesses all over the place. So the apothegmata, the sayings, are not meant to be a do all of these things and you will be saved. They are meant to be chronicles, little pithy chronicles of one step that helps someone. Um, and we'll talk next week about especially why things like fasting and anger, um, or fasting and learning to control one's temper were so important here. But they saw themselves as doing what Jesus asked everyone to do. They did not see themselves as being an elite. They saw themselves as actually hearing the gospel and going to do it. Um, and so inspired lots of other people to do it. Okay, quickly. Um, 
Anthony, we talked about the first week. I'm going to skip him for now. Read his biography. It's widely available online. Athanasius wrote it. It's phenomenal. But he is known as sort of the father of monasticism. Um, and there are very different portraits we get of him, one of his official biographer and one from the sayings. Macarius the Egyptian was born uh, in a small village. Uh, before becoming a monk, he was a camel driver um, and also a smuggler. Um, so kind of a Han Solo figure. Um, and it was said that like, when pious people later in his life came to talk to him, he would refuse. But if someone came to talk shop like the old days, he would immediately open up and be affable. Um, so he would seal uh, nitre, which is sodium carbonate, as a uh, preservative, essentially, out of the desert and sell it. It was valuable. Uh, the government had a monopoly on it, so they regulated it. So he was a smuggler. At some point, um, he abandoned camel driving and smuggling and settled on the edge of his vi village as a hermit, much as Anthony did. Um, villagers were drawn to his holiness, and they tried to force him to be ordained. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. There's sort of this repugnance against ordination, against taking holy orders all over this place. Um, he went to another village. Uh, a young girl accused him of getting her pregnant. And so uh, he began to pay for the child with the work that he prayed and wove baskets and didn't put up a fuss, just said, okay, I better, I better pay for this child that apparently I fathered. Um, and uh, the villagers um, even, you know, at, at one point beat him for, for knocking this girl up uh, as they saw it. Uh, eventually, when, when the girl went to have a baby, she had a very difficult childbirth and she saw it as a sign that maybe she ought to tell the truth. And so she told the village, yeah, it was actually this other guy. It was not. <laughs> and uh, Macarius was like, okay. And then he fled the village. Um, but he saw himself as doing penance for the whole village. You know, he, just, he, wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna argue with them. He was just gonna take it. Um, around 3.30, he founded Skidus, one of the biggest monastic settlements that, that we hear of. Uh, attracted a large circle of disciples, acquired a reputation for the ability to read hearts, that is to see exactly what's going on with Mike, even if he's trying to BS me, um, to just know in a way that was penetrating. Uh, you know, the stories we get of the heart readers are not that they're manipulative, but that they can just see right through to the issue and can provide tremendous freedom, uh, kind of like when someone puts the word on the emotion that you can't quite articulate. No, it's this, and then you feel freed. Um, he eventually consents to be ordained uh, for his monks so that they have access to the Eucharist. Um, and uh, he dies in Skidus around 390. Uh, a lot of the sayings of the Desert Fathers are about him. Um, one of his sayings, do no evil to anyone and do not judge anyone. Observe this and you will be saved. It's that easy, guys. It's that easy. Um, I'll talk about a few of these and take five more minutes. Is that okay? Um, um, I'll talk about John and Moses real quick, and I want to talk about the Desert Fathers and Mothers. Um, John the Dwarf, or John the Little, uh, apparently he was very small, became one of the leading figures of Skidus in the late 4th and 5th centuries, so following Macarius. Um, John the Little of stature, or John the Dwarf, um, grew up in a village, as many of, many of these folks do. They don't come from the cities. Uh, soon after Anthony's death, uh, he goes to Skidus and becomes a monk and becomes a disciple of one Abba Amoas, who is a very stern and distant figure. Um, doesn't talk to his disciples, doesn't let him walk next to him, apparently didn't really want to be the father figure to all these, all these monks. Uh, but John continues to be kind to him throughout his life, and um, especially the last 12 years of this old Abba's life, John is the one who stays next to him and tends him uh, while he's sick. Um, and finally, his Abba blesses him on his deathbed and says, maybe you're not so bad, um, which is as good as it gets. When he dies, John goes out on his own. He attracts a circle of disciples. Um, but all the, most of the sayings attributed to him suggest that he had real problems with anger, um, that he was just an explosive person um, who could, could berate his disciples. Um, and uh, probably never ordained to a clerical state. Um, leaves Skidus in 407 after a barbarian raid sacks it, 
uh, and dies around 409 at the age of 70. A house is not built, he says, by beginning at the top and working down. You must begin with the foundations in order to reach the top. What does this mean? The foundation is our neighbor, whom we must win, and that is the place to begin. For all the commandments of Christ depend on this one. We're going to talk about that next week. We must win our neighbor. That's what they're doing in the desert. But what does that mean? How do I win my neighbor by fleeing from my neighbor? Um, maybe some of you have had to flee from those you love in order to save them from yourself. <laughs> All right, one more before the ladies. Moses the Black, um, probably Ethiopian, which is known as Moses the Black. And Ethiopia tends to be the name that you give to anyone from sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, he'd been the house slave of a government official, but was dismissed uh, and became a robber. Um, led, led a band of highwaymen, probably did murder, um, so had a very saucy life. Uh, and we don't know why he became a monk, only that he did. He was also a skeetus. Um, he had to endure racial prejudice. Some of the stories talk about people making fun of him because he's black. Um, and so a lot of his sayings show some sensitivity to those who are excluded. He died in 407 when some raiders uh, came off the Libyan desert and sacked Skeetus. Um, he dies along with, with others. Um, some flee, he doesn't. Um, and his last words, as for me, I've been waiting for this day for many years, that the word of the Lord Jesus may be fulfilled, which says, all who take the sword will die by the sword. It seemed like he saw his death by raiders as being sort of a fitting justice, uh, justice and embraces it. Um, and one monk hides under a pile of wood and watches the death and writes about it later or passes it on. Okay. I'm going to squeak poem in. I want to end with the ladies. Um, we have three prominent figures in the sayings, in the Apophegmata, um, who are attributed to, to women. Um, and then in Syria and Palestine, women go on to play a large role. Uh, Melania the Elder, who we started with two weeks ago, founds a, a monastery there. Um, we may have occasion to talk about them. There's a lot of contemporary scholarship going into trying to recreate what we know about these women in a time when you don't write about women um, and you're certainly not going to collect their sayings. Um, and there's some great sources I can point you to. Uh, there's a book call, called um, Band of Angels by a woman named Kate Cooper that's especially phenomenal. Uh, but the stories and sayings are told from the view of a male celibate. So even the sayings of women that we get are sort of told through, through the male gaze. Um, unsurprisingly, women are cast in the negative light, temperatures um, who come to haunt monks. But here and there, we find scattered reports of women who take up residence. There's even one story of uh, one Abba Basarion who encounter an old man living in a cave, who just, that old man just spends his whole life weaving baskets, praying, living the life of an Abba. When that man finally dies and they go to get the body, they discover it was a woman the whole time. Um, so there may have been many more women living in the desert who simply don't care to share that fact. Um, but we have three, and we have very little biographical material. Uh, Ama Theodora, she seems to focus on the importance of asceticism, but also the reality of the resurrection as a living principle of our actual living flesh, um, and focused on humility over against things like fastings and vigils uh, as being important. Of the nine sayings attributed to Sarah, several refer to her struggles with lust, uh, with fornication, which tells us that this is not just a problem for, for men, monks, um, but whatever we're going to mean by fornication, we'll talk about that next week, because it doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means, but it means also that. Uh, this is something that women are concerned with, too. Um, and she emphasizes, um, she, she describes herself as being, and when she's accosted by some monks at some point, she tells them, it's me who's the man, you are the woman. Um, so there's some interesting gender bending that goes on in the sayings. Um, not just women dressing as men in order to pass, uh, but also some, uh, and we see this sort of throughout this literature, um, some flexibility with respect to what gender is and who all are being called to be. 
probably in light of um, certain early theologians whose work may have been known to these people, this suggests that early Adam, or the first human, was hermaphroditic. Um, this is sort of a live trope in the early, early tradition. There are others, it's not the only one. Um, but that the fall is also a fall into like a gendered existence, and we're all trying to be restored into a place where, as St. Paul says, there is no male or female, um, such that even the resurrected Christ could be seen as encompassing. Um, I probably won't be here next week because I said that. <laughs> but, but it's there uh, if, you, if you look for it. Um, and then finally, Emma Sinclitica has 27 things attributed to her. Um, she apparently was born on the sea because a lot of her images uh, and sayings have to do with the winds and the sails. Um, and she uses a lot of geographical metaphors for the spiritual life. Um, one fifth century biography says she was born in Alexandria, Alexandria and chose a life of asceticism and celibacy. After her family died, she moved into her tomb and lived there for a while, as one does. <laughs> so there were some, some female desert dwellers, but most seemed to continue to live in the city. And so within the cities, we see the emergence of a different kind of asceticism, one that mimics the desert life. Um, but takes place within sort of commerce. And so we see, what I'll leave you with is, whatever's going on in the desert, <coughs> excuse me, it is not unlinked to Christian life everywhere. This is one particular fruit, but we have to trace it, twig, leaf, root, all the way back to where the churches are to see how they're feeding off one another um, and why some choose to go to flee. Others flee by remaining in place, um, which will tend to be, I think, what we, we tend to do um, so we'll talk more about that next week. Quick timeline, just so you see how these figures sort of figure in. Uh, Anthony starts in the late third century. Here's Constantine. And so you see them sort of overlapping with one another. Um, and then once Scetus is destroyed, the landscape begins to shift. So I'll share these slides, by the way, too. Um, And here's an interesting diagram of how they're all related. Wow. Uh, not by blood, but just who talks about who and who seems to be known by whom. Um, Antony is a key figure, appointment who we didn't talk about, Makarios. Slides will be available for you to peruse. Okay. Our life and death is with our neighbor. If we gain our brother or sister, we have gained God. But if we scandalize our brother or sister, we have sinned against Christ. That's where we'll pick up. Good? Thanks, Sharon. Okay.